So we're going to carry on our conversation about electrifying mining. And it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of this session, Bill Alamon. Um, is very experienced. He was heading energy management for Ford. He was also at Anglo Gold Ashanti. And now he uh, leads Conduit Process Excellence, which is a consultancy focusing on resource conservation and applying operational excellence tools and strategies. Great. Thank you for that introduction. And as the uh one of the Americans here, I'm also here to claim political asylum, so I was looking for a, a reason to get into the country. So, <laughs> and uh, thank you uh, to Peter for that, um, that detailed presentation. That was excellent, a lot of good information. So uh, Adrian's correct. We really don't have a whole lot to talk about, so I guess we'll talk, uh, talk about the, how the Leafs are doing this year. But, <laughs> but uh, let's go uh, around, the, uh, around the, the session and just uh, some quick introductions, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Samantha Espley. I'm a technical director at Valley Base Metals and uh, overseeing uh, things like electrification and underground mining. Hi, my name is Jitin Law. I'm with ELO Solutions. Uh, we work with a variety of mining companies on uh, developing and implementing their innovation strategy and also building better relationship with the government to de-risk the innovation program. Hi, Emily Thorne Corte, president of Thorne Associates. Uh, I work with mining companies uh, and other industrial companies to help uh, reduce energy costs and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and have recently led in conjunction with uh, Mark Passy from Glencore to energy design reviews uh, of which electrification was a part of the opportunities identified. Go ahead, Peter. People, it's, a, it's a separate YouTube video. people forgot so. who I was, Peter Xavier. Yeah. <laughs> VP for Glencore Subway Operations. Very good, thank you. Well, let's start um, sort of at a, at a easy high level, uh, just, you know, justification or initial thoughts on uh, electrification and the benefits. And again, Peter went through uh, quite a bit of those, but, you know, uh, what other uh, benefits or um, uh, challenges uh, do you, do you anticipate, you know, as, you, as you're thinking or your clients are thinking of electrification, uh, what are those initial thoughts and things that you have to sort of run the numbers on and investigate? And I'll open it up so whoever wants to. Sure, yeah. So Peter mentioned uh, a number of the most significant, of course, uh, elimination of diesel, uh, natural gas in terms of your, if you're heating, your ventilation or if it's propane heated uh, can... Uh, cause some reductions as well, uh, reductions in electricity as well. Um, you mentioned the health benefits, there's also maintenance benefits, um, so I think it was about 10% of, of maintenance benefits. One of the things I also wanted to touch on is actually most of the focus has been on battery electric vehicles, but we also looked uh, for one of the projects at uh, Trolley Assist. And uh, so for those not familiar with the Trolley Assist uh, system, uh, it's, you have an overhead uh, catenary line, you have your trucks um, modified to have a pantograph, which is kind of, I think of streetcars, just to, the sort of metal part that connects into the line, um, and you have to have some substations and positioning sensors. Anyways, and it helps you um, improve your productivity, potentially. So with the trolley assist um, system, uh, typically vendors are talking about sort of 20% extra haulage capacity, uh, as well as potentially doubling the speed going uphill. Uh, so those can be some potential benefits. Um, yeah, so I think those are some of the main things. Can, can I just add to that? Yes. So excellent points, Emily. And um, the trolley assist are some of the Karuna trucks that we use at Creighton and Coleman Mine in Sudbury at Valley, and we've been using them since 1995. So very fast, very quiet machines, um, and very reliable. So tremendous opportunities for other, op uh, other mining companies to look at the trolley assist system um, to haul uphill. And, you know, I just add to the other benefits of electrifications would be, I think, from the people from the people perspective. So talking to our operators, so you know, here's the new toaster on wheels, right? That uh, is the joke. Um, but when they start using these machines, they love them. There's less heat, right? There's, um, there's clean air. Um, it, it's a much more enjoyable environment from there, no noise. And when they dig into the muck pile, it has a lot of power. 
right? So they're not, you know, trying to feather in and get, get that scoop bucket full. Um, it, it's got a, a lot of opportunities for the operators. And, that, you know, so for us, I think that was part of our biggest concern was how was the uh, miner going to adjust to the new, new culture, right, with electrification, and it's gone really well. And I would say um, for us that that's a huge benefit. Just quickly, uh, to add to Emily's point, I think with electrification, we can broaden that a little bit than just the electric vehicle. So some examples are uh, Godex have installed a rail barrier system. It's a material movement system that is fully electric. So thinking about not just swapping out the engine from a diesel car and putting an electric engine as a replacement for everything we're thinking, but also more on a system level, there are other opportunities for electrification more than just a truck for truck. Uh, the other point uh, to your question on what are the benefits, I think in this forum, uh, we're really looking for ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And fuel switch is just a natural way of doing that. It's more efficient. And in places like Ontario, as Peter had mentioned, the grid is much cleaner. That's where the opportunity is to really meet that climate, climate change opportunity. And I just, on that point, I just took my, my mind to say, you know, even if you weren't on a clean grid, um, going to battery electric reduces your ventilation requirements, which is the largest electricity user of an underground mine. And so even in that case, it would help. And so, you know, the maintenance aspects are very real, a lot less moving parts, the, 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 the efficiency, the performance, the torque into the muck pile, much better. But I, but I think just to key on sort of the, 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 the personnel attraction, the, the, you know, those aspects, and I think this morning in the, in the, in the panel was talked about as well as people you know, feeling that the operation from an air quality perspective is different because, you know, even though we meet regulatory requirements and we by all means stand by the safety of the operations, the reality is heat and moisture and humidity and dust and, I mean, these things are fatiguing and we see that now with our people running our autonomous scoops from, from surface, you know, they were a bit hesitant from the technology at early onset but now they absolutely love it. So I think, you know, electrification underground has the opportunity to make everybody's workplace like that person that's sitting on surface in an environmentally controlled atmosphere. And if you want to attract new people into the industry, obviously, I think that's a, that's a huge aspect. People don't want to come to work to do what their grandfathers did, I think. So, uh, so I think it's just another piece of that, that change that, you know, to, to get people interested in the industry, get people understanding what the, where the products they use come from, see an industry that produces those products, uses those products, recycles those pro products. So I think it, it really is a nice, complete story. And uh, mining has an opportunity to, you know, because it's the best application, I think, a BV application requires no subsidy. It stands on its own two feet. It's a good entry point for the other applications to learn from. So. Excellent. And uh, myself, I, I, I spent a few uh, decades in manufacturing, and as soon as you migrate uh, tooling, for example, from pneumatic or something else to electric that enables you to capture a lot of data and do things with that. And again, I'm not the, I'm not the mining expert, I'm kind of the sophomore, only got five years in the, in the industry, but you know, in drilling or other applications, you're going to have for analytics and things, you're going to get a lot more, more data back. And there was a discussion, I think it was this morning as well, about fuel and security and theft and all those things. Um, I've seen issues, uh, I personally have seen issues at a mine in, in, in Africa where it wasn't just the cost side of the fuel theft, it was the fact that there was organized crime and there were deaths because of that. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's people's lives and such. So there's so many, there's so many benefits. Uh, no, that's excellent, thank you for that. Um, what about status of, uh, Peter went through, you know, where they're at, what else have you seen in industry or maybe where you're at in your, you know, in your journey towards uh, electrification? At Valet, I can just say uh, we are um, on our way. Yeah, very similar to Glencore to what Peter has talked about. So the utility vehicles are available and we have been um, buying and using the utility vehicles. Um, We've been using the Karuna trucks since 95, so those are, are well established. 
And uh, yeah, the OEMs for the prime movers are starting to come, aren't they? So we're, we're getting to the point where Artisan has got the 40 ton truck. So there are some, these are the battery electric um, machines as opposed to the trolley. Uh, certainly tethered machines have been around for decades, but the, it's the battery electric prime movers that are really the challenge. Um, and I think, you know, if I was to sit in the OEM shoes, and um, this is very expensive for them to develop this equipment and is probably counter to their diesel fleet that uh, is very profitable for, for the OEMs in terms of selling and maintaining. Uh, so now you want something different, mining industry? Uh, are you sure? So I, you know, I think some of it is sort of sitting back waiting to see is this really happening or is this just KL Gold with their you know, specific issue? But is, this, is, this is real. We need this technology for deep mining. We really do, and for the health of our, of our employees. I would say those are the two key drivers for us. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just add on to that. I think uh, some of the OEMs are moving forward exactly like you said. So with, uh, with McLean Engineering, for example, uh, they've taken a step and, and trying to help uh, the risk some of these challenges that you talked about. And they're part of the uh, advanced manufacturing supercluster, which is a platform allow you to be in an ecosystem so that you can de-risk and leverage some of, the, some of the other technology providers to really move to the next level. So I think it's, it's really encouraging to see that some of the OEMs are taking uh, those initiatives to, to get better to, to, so that like, they can solve some of these problems. Otherwise, outside of the mining, I think the uh, large transportation the sector are really doing quite a bit as well. I mean, there's the very popular, famous Tesla trucks that can run 800 kilometers and on some sort of special batteries, but there are actually quite a number of different uh, manufacturers starting moving to that direction. Um, we do a little bit of work in the port uh, sector, and that, which have very similar challenges as mining, and we can see some movement in that area. I, I guess, quickly, I mean, it's, it's nice to know that I think a lot of the BEV push is coming from right here in Ontario which I have to say I'm impressed with the OEM response because it's sort of, a, you know, dealing with niche clientele and they have such big product portfolios, you know, it's tough to get attention sometimes. So, um, and, you know, proud that a lot of that's coming in Ontario, a lot of companies in Ontario pushing for BVs. And, you know, to be honest, even though we're hard on, like to be hard on OEMs, a lot of them have responded, uh, you know, quite well. And a lot of that's happening right here in this jurisdiction. So, it's great. From a carbon footprint or emissions, let's say, standpoint, um, kind of ask a, I don't know, I guess I get to ask all the dumb questions, I guess, but, uh, um, you know, if, if for a mine that's remote and is generating its own power, uh, you know, is there, real, is there a benefit to, you know, going electric, um, you know, you're, you're burning diesel at some point. If it's not at the vehicle, it's at the power station, right? Um, you know, what, does, it, does it pay, I mean, versus having a, a vehicle that's underground perhaps that is a, a, a hybrid where you're burning fuel on board and you've got traction motors. So it's, you know, does it, that I would, I would imagine that's gonna make the, the decision, the calculation a little more different. You have to, you know, look at the, some of the benefits and such. I can comment from, from Boise Bay um, perspective. So this is a remote site in northern Newfoundland, Labrador. And um, yes, we have uh, gensets there, diesel gensets, creating our, our electricity to run the, the mill, the, the living facilities, and we're going underground. Uh, we just uh, announced uh, $2 billion to go underground after uh, our ore body there, and we are now like looking at battery electric equipment for this site. And you would think, well, why would you do that? Uh, so we've, um, we are looking at it from a sustainability point of view, from the environment point of view, so using less, um, less uh, fuel, or, um, in t making our electricity, so we're going with wind, uh, we're looking at small nuclear reactors, we're looking at other forms of energy and green energy, and so as a company moving towards a new format and, and moving towards uh, electric equipment underground as well, and sizing our fans like Peter is talking about, so using a ventilation control system for that mine to reduce our overall uh, um, ventilation requirements and energy requirements for the operation. 
Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good point because it triggers another question that I had, which is, you know, we've obviously been talking about renewable energy and generating power for, for two days. But once you've generated that renewable energy, what do you do with it? Are you going to then turn around and waste it? on inefficient processes, that's really not being a good steward of the earth, right? So, you know, using the, generating the power uh, through renewable sources and then transforming it, staying within elect, uh, the electrical transport, and then now you're, you're, you know, using the end result, the end equipment being, being fully electric. So, yeah, there's kind of a whole process or ecosystem there. As far as uh, um, funding and justification, again, I know we've had some side discussions about funding vehicles, and, and I wanted to bring that up. And you know, how do you how do you cost justify, and what what are some of the ways to to um, maybe get some incentives and some help from uh, the government? I can comment on that in the context of the of Ontario and uh, with Glencore, we're fortunate enough um, to have the support of the uh, independent electricity system operator. Um, so they have uh, contributed to the studies that have been completed. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we did energy design reviews, which were not only for identifying um, and doing sort of cost benefit of the, uh, the battery and, and the greenhouse gas emissions reductions associated, but also identifying other opportunities as well. And uh, so the ISO does have the industrial accelerator program for those of you in Ontario. Um, and uh, then they will fund um, the incremental costs up to 70%, uh, up to 10 million. So it can be uh, quite lucrative for uh, any additional costs that you may have. And uh, just in terms of the energy design review process, uh, I think you, you were touching on it earlier, Bill, uh, that um, making, you, we're talking here about renewable energy, but uh, the first step really is you don't want to oversize and pay more for a very large renewable energy plant, right? You want to right size it. So doing energy efficiency uh, first is, is really key and to properly design the mine and the power that's going to be powering the mine um, to the right size by doing energy efficiency and building energy efficiency in the design is, uh, is an important step. Yeah, you know, I'll add to that. Um, on, maybe on a more on the federal context. Uh, so the the current government we have in Canada is very big on three main objectives. They're looking for Canada to become an innovation leader. They're looking for clean technology to mitigate climate change uh, uh, situations, and they're looking for economic growth. Those those are the th three key drivers. And now I'm going to ask Samantha and Peter: Are they do they, do they align with also with most of your business objectives? I would I would say yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. So so because the federal government is pushing for that agenda, and because business have the same alignment, there's actually a lot of opportunities to work together on unlocking some of these funding that's available in, in quite large amounts, uh, and to really help you mitigate your risk of your innovation portfolio, and also help you accelerate on that adoption. Sometimes it's not about, well, we have, uh, you know, we're building in mind we have $50 million for this aspect, but if you have $60 million, could you do more with that? You probably could, and, and something better. So so we, we've done quite a bit of that work, and we're very uh, proud to, and happy to share with some of the results. So we've got um, a couple of companies, more than $40 million in the last two years through this approach. Um, so I think it's actually a really good opportunity uh, federally. And um, just a little no side note, elections coming up next year, so there could be some better opportunity in the short term, so maybe watch out for that. It's a great point, if I could just add, Bill. Uh, so not only are the government funding programs there to take advantage of, but there's also um, carbon taxes, right? So, I mean, on the other foot, right? So, you, you know, this is a big driver for us as well. So encouraging uh, industry to do the right thing and reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions. And so, you know, Valley as a company has set a target. You know, we're going to reduce 16% by 2030 and aim for zero by 2050. So, you know, very uh, aggressive goals on our part, but doing the right thing. Um, and um, one of the incentives is the, uh, the carbon taxing uh, schemes. I don't know, uh, Peter, if you... No, I mean, it's, it's an element, although there's, there's, a bit, there's a bit of uncertainty in that uh, field at, at present. But, you know, you can see from a base metals, you know, we have our underground operations, but you see the tremendous transportation requirements we have even once the product hits the surface. So... Um, you know, there's, there's opportunity there, but, you know, it, it is an energy-intensive business. It's geographically spread out. Um, but I think we sort of have two minds. One, 
we're proud of where we are. So if you look at sort of nickel production in our jurisdiction, uh, per se CO2, uh, you know, unit across the globe, we're leaps and bounds better than anywhere else on the planet. Um, so we're proud of that, but we're also, you know, looking to improve. So, you know, I think that's the, the, the situation in terms of what's the potential. Um, you know, mining in its entirety is 1% of GHG in, in Ontario. And that's not to minimize what it is. I mean, but that's, that's, the, that's the max potential. And I see a lot of activity of people trying to reduce that. And funding is, is tricky because sometimes, you know, for example, if you look at the previous cap and trade program, a lot of the BEV sort of innovations because they were happening, decisions of design today in terms of approval project for it to come in later, it didn't qualify for, for anything. So it was sort of, but in the meantime, you're, you're paying the carbon taxes, you're paying the emission cap taxes. So sometimes it's just, you know, how do you get the policy to, to match up? And like I alluded to in the presentation, it's a multifaceted initiative. It's not a singular GHG. That's an important part. But you really get good innovation when you're hitting on multiple pillars um, with, with an idea, right? So. I think he sort of answered my next question, too, which is, you know, for, we talked a lot about underground and the benefits, of course, but what about open pit, open cast? Uh, and really the GHG uh, benefit is the, the, main, the main driver. Uh, sounds like I, I can't think of, you know, other than the equipment itself and maybe, you know, traction and, and those sorts of things. But uh, there was a mention also, I think it was this morning, regarding, uh, you know, training and maintenance. And, you know, we've got uh, all our folks that are used to grease and turning wrenches and so on, and now they're going to be electricians and computer programmers. So uh, how are you planning or, you know, addressing that uh, shift? Are you doing retraining or, you know, how to displacing workers? How does that impact the labor force? I'll jump in again. <laughs> uh, well, I mentioned the Karuna trucks at uh, Creighton and Coleman Mine, so we've been doing electrified equipment for many, many years and have a very mature workforce, uh, both electricians and our heavy-duty equipment mechanics working on these machines. But yes, it would be, I think, uh, a transition as retraining uh, our very talented uh, tradespeople in our, in our operations. That would that would be Valet's philosophy. Yeah, and it's something you have to prepare for sure. But the maintenance is so much simplified on it, you sort of have that benefit. But if you look at equipment in terms of its sophistication, like a even a jumbo, a, a drill, even a even a typical diesel truck, I mean it's over the last ten years they've gotten much more sophisticated. I mean, even look at your own vehicle you drive. So I think I think the, this in that context it's Actually, I see it as rather small, a small difference for people to get accustomed to. Now, if you get into, you know, optimizing your mind design, optimizing, you know, those sorts of things, your energy management system, you know, like if you really want to get full maximum benefit, I think that's where, um, you know, some of the technical work actually needs to be, uh, you know, directed to in, in those sorts of problems. So I, I see that as a, a bigger question than sort of how we're going to maintain. Uh, battery electric piece of equipment. Just to add um, about the trolley assist, there's also maintenance benefits for that. And uh, due to the productivity, there can also be some labor savings as well from the trolley assist. I don't know if you've, you've seen that, Samantha. Or... Yeah, very good point, Emily. I did, just adding to Peter's comment on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the IT side, right? So we're not just becoming battery electric fleets underground, or or even on surface. We're looking also at trolley assist and our open pits and things like that. But it, I mean, we're, we have digitized mines, right? Or moving towards digitized mines. So always had fiber optic cable down the shaft and, and now we have wireless underground and now we have telemetry off of our equipment. Now we have tagging and tracking so we know where all the equipment and all the people are and now we have an energy management system or, or ventilation control system that sits on top and so you need people, um, electrical engineers, programmers, those types of people to come into our industry to help to help it um, to flourish and take advantage of the big data that's coming in and the automation and control systems. I want to just quickly uh, add to that. I, certainly, I think the labor force is going to change. And we're going to look at this panel. And the, in, right here, we have women outnumbering men for the first time in this conference, I, I believe. And, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> So, so I think diversity uh, is going to come with the future of the work. And it's not just in mining industry, industry is in all industries. 
And I think with electrification as a starting point into this digitized mind, the future, things are going to change. We're going to need more people, but we're all going to have different jobs. That's, that's my point. I couldn't bring that point up, so I had to. <laughs> well, very good. Um, should we open it up for questions? A good timing? Okay, excellent. And we have the doors locked and sealed, so unless, <laughs> until we get five questions, you can't get your luggage, so. All no? You want to be here all night? Okay. Well, all this is wonderful, and uh, congratulations on the panel. Uh, I was on an all-male panel, and a female friend of mine pointed that out at the Progressive Mind Forum not so long ago. Uh, what are we doing to reach people like you to enter the mining industry? Are we telling the universities and so on that mining is changing? Well, maybe the change, the, change the perception and the, that it's high-tech. It's not just, yeah. That's a, a really super question. I think that there are um, organizations like the CIM, the, the CIM National, who uh, walk the talk in terms of having diversification in terms of their leadership. Um, if you're aware of Angela Hamelin, who is the new executive director of the CIM. So, you know, just changing the way that the bulletin is sent out, the types of stories that they cover. Um, I would say even the fact that the CIM has technical section. Uh, sessions that are their technical excellence that they're known for also looking at people development and helping to get the word out that um, this is a very diverse and very interesting fun industry uh, for us all to be involved in whether you're lawyers or you're technical people or IT specialists or tradespeople I think that's one advocacy group that uh, I think that we can rely on within Canada to get the word out uh, I, I don't know if anybody else has any other perspective. You know, women in mining, those types of organizations exist for sure to help do that as well. Um, but there, there are probably many other uh, I ideas. Maybe I'll just add quickly. I, th I think we, uh, mining companies can probably do a little bit better, but uh, the, some of the company I work with certainly uh, talk about that to government when, they, when we are having this engagement on how, how the future is changing and how we can bring better messages to the community. And hopefully the government gets it as well, that helps advocate on our behalf in some later time. Sure, so I have a couple other hats besides the Thorne Associates. I'm, I instruct the Certified Energy Manager uh, course where there are a number of mining companies typically uh, each session and so um, I try and then the rest of the people are not miners so when I give a lot of mining examples in the course um, then I try and portray and, and show how you know mining companies are really doing a good job at energy management um, and so I think that that does help having role models also uh, I'm the only woman instructor of in, in Canada um, to do that so just I think that's also uh, important and then I'm also on the board of directors of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers and um, there you know we we um, try and go out to engineering students and talk to them about well, many professions but mining being one of them and engineering and showing how we're trying to showcase you know how engineering is diverse and on the board um, already for the last five years it's it's uh, gender 50% uh, not just 30% which professional engineers are trying to achieve but 50%, so. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, from an organization perspective, you probably see more mines, and even from a Glencore perspective, I wouldn't have thought we would be in this space a couple of years ago, but we're on social media platforms, we're putting out innovation videos. I mean, you see, I think you see that across the board, across a lot of mining organizations. Uh, just a shout out to my, my colleagues from the Ontario Mining Association in the audience. I mean, they do a lot of outreach, preparing for a big 100th anniversary campaign. Uh, we bring in elementary school teachers every year. A lot of the Ontario mining organizations assist with that to teach them, you know, about mining and that it's just transformative to see their impressions, you know, the stereotype sort of erode in their minds and they come back with a full new appreciation of, you know, our commitment to health and safety technology, the, the need we have, the, the, the place we, we, we play in society, right? So, so I think all those things together help. But it's it's all you know it's all about putting it out there and, and I mean from the Canadian perspective natural resources is is a strength we can we can leverage it to give people access to well paying you know good jobs pays way way above the industrial average largest private sector employer of indigenous peoples in Canada I mean there's so many 
reasons to, to look to the industry. I mean, even this room, you know, even if you're not working directly for a mining company, you're, you're sort of working, you know, towards it or assisting. I mean, it's so, it, there's an immense diversity in terms of where you want to fit in into, into the mining ecosystem. So, tons of opportunity. I'll, uh, I'll thank Emily for mentioning the Certified Energy Manager program. I'm a CEM myself. And the Association of Energy Engineers, who proctors that and many other certifications, you know, they've been trying to find a way to sort of, you know, is there opportunity for advocacy and such in the mining industry? And they have a, a global congress uh, once a year, usually September. It's either in D.C. or Atlanta. But anyhow, um, you know, that may be something that uh, if we get enough of us who have grown up sort of on the demand side and the energy saving side, you know, to get some discussion going there and have a track on, you know, industry specific challenges on the, on the efficiency role. So yeah, if it's, it's you might be surprised. Maybe you can ask around how many CEMs oh, are in yeah. the room. Oh yeah, how many do how many CEMs do we have? Oh, yeah. Okay, well let's triple that by next year, eh? So, <laughs> any other questions, please? Yes, um, I would like to talk to other type of electrifying mining sector. Two years ago, I asked to the in this conference about the electrification of the electromobility. And some of the persons of the, of the panel talk about trucks. And I say, no, the problems are not the trucks, are the people. There are some mines, especially big mines, they work with seven, even 10,000 people, and they go to the mine every day with diesel um, buses. Why don't you use that? The good, uh, the good news today that three weeks ago, I remember in Peru, there were some companies are looking now for to make tenders for the next year, you know, to make uh, pilot projects, you know, to use this uh, this type of of transport, and especially because there, even in Santiago, in Chile, they are receiving now a lot of electric electric buses, thinking about the city, but not thinking about the mine. And the mine has two problems, not only the problem of electricity, but also the, the carbon footprint. And that's all, it's, all in. it's not a question, but if you want to comment this. Yeah, that's, an that's an excellent point, because uh, electric buses is not something new. So why are we burning you know, dino dinosaur juice to move our people from the community to their place of, of work? Well, yeah, and I just wanted to add, like, it's an excellent point, and, uh, you know, I, I often forget about Brazil, so Valley's huge iron ore, right, and we, 160,000 employees in Brazil working in iron ore, and yes, we're looking at our trains, we, you know, we, we're a massive um, material mover, and so getting away from uh, diesel, any type of fossil fuel, and going to electric, electric trains, even our ships, our massive Valley Max ships, um, that use bunker oil, so we're trying to get away from that. So, what is the solution? I, you know, it's an excellent point, and certainly as a as an industry rep, we are looking for alternatives. And also the ports. And the ports as well. Yep. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, very good point. Uh, that kind of illustrates the difference if you're looking at greenhouse gas emissions between scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So for those who are not familiar with that, then the scope one emissions are the ones that you're burning diesel, um, natural gas on site. Scope two emissions would be um, those from electricity that you purchase from a utility. Here in Ontario, they're very low, luckily, but in other jurisdictions, not so much. But then you would be referring to the scope three of how your workers get to your site. And currently, um, I understand most uh, jurisdictions are only uh, uh, monitoring and or limiting scope one and two, but inevitably scope three uh, will become more important. So, good point. We have another question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, another comment and question about uh, uh, EVs. Uh, in generally in Canada, when we talk about EVs, we're usually talking about battery uh, EVs, electric vehicles or, or uh, hybrid. Uh, but uh, uh, there is another technology. Uh, the hydrogen EVs are very popular. In, uh, in Korea, South Korea, and in Japan. And also in the slide this morning, we saw that uh, there was a shout out to uh, Hydrogenics and Ballard Technology, which are two world uh, leading uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology companies, one based in, uh, in Mississauga, the other in Vancouver. And in fact, Canada is the Silicon Valley of hydrogen technology in the world. So, um, so now to the question. Um, 
Peter, I'm wondering if you could, uh, you touched on it at the beginning of your presentation about the Raglan mine, uh, which is very important because it is actually the first uh, mine in Canada that uses uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology from uh, Hydrogenics right here from Toronto. And I'm wondering if, uh, if we could hear some comment about uh, the possibility of an opportunity uh, for EV, uh, hydrogen EV uh, trucking uh, and uh, in both for un underground operations and for surface operations because hydrogenics and Ballard technologies being used in trains in Europe, in Germany, and buses all across China, why not use it underground and on the surface in Canada? Hydrogen. Maybe starting with Peter. I appreciate the question. I, I certainly mentioned Raglan because I mean, important feed for my smelter that I'm responsible for, and Sudbury is my largest nickel uh, producer and, and sort of highlighted them. But um, unfortunately, from a technical perspective, to answer your question, I'm, I'm just not familiar with all the inter, de inter workings detail. But certainly, if you want to sort of hang back and give me your business card, I can sort of make a connection. But, but Raglan obviously is, is a unique situation because it's on diesel grid. It's, it's obviously very cold as well. So even battery performance is something they've the toyed with it's just hard to experiment a lot in that type of jurisdiction but you know all the diesels transport up by by ship you know on, on top of on top of everything else so so I'm, I'm aware of some of the workings i just probably couldn't intelligently give you a good answer but happy to follow up with you as well can help you out here but peter i um worked in the uh, fuel cell industry for five years actually before joining energy management um so uh the first fuel cell uh, for mining uh, vehicles that i'm aware of i believe was at anglo platinum in south africa a right. number of years ago um so i think that that uh, of course the platinum miners are uh, inherently very interested in fuel cells um at least the pem the proton exchange membrane low temperature fuel cells um which have the platinum catalysts in them which are very expensive hence why some of the issues with fuel cells historically have been the high cost. Um, degradation as well has been an issue. Um, I'm not quite sure. Again, it's, it's now been 10 years since I've been out of fuel cells, so uh, I don't know all the latest details, but I'm assuming kind of like batteries that the degradation rates, they have been able to, uh, to reduce um, as well. So I think it is something that's worth, uh, worth examining uh, in more detail. And I know I would suggest that you go to Anglo uh, Platinum. Maybe give a positive note, or maybe not so positive. There, we, we have been working on a project where it uses hydrogen for surface transportation of ore. Um, where I, I know some of you are in the session earlier. Really, when you look at it, when you look at the imagine a picture of energy density, um, hydrogen fuel cells are certainly higher than most of the batteries. So in a, in the in in that future space, we're going to have different applications for different purposes. So I see very strongly that fuel cells well has its place for longer distance haul larger capa capacity requirements. Uh, maybe it's not here today, but I think it's certainly happening. So we have worked on a project. It's not at this moment going ahead, but this is certainly um, in the right direction. I can also just elaborate a bit on the Raglan uh, project, so because it's uh, it was done in part with Hatch, who I used to work for. Anyways, and um, so from my understanding, it was a hydrogen, a fuel cell, an electrolyzer um, loop with a wind turbine, um, or maybe. Um, and so it has been, to my knowledge, at least recently, working really t relatively well. Um, so. Yeah, I think that it's a promising technology. Now, it was quite expensive and needed government uh, subsidies at this stage, but again, just like solar PVs and energy storage, the costs are coming down. We're good. Okay. Well, okay. We're short on questions, so we'll unlatch the doors ahead of time. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panel.